Good morning, and welcome to our third public hearing on consumer broadband labels. My name is Alejandro Rourke, and I serve as the Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. And for those of you that are tuning in that might be new to our work, CGB is responsible for developing and implementing the federal communications, consumer policies, including disability access, as well as serving as the public face of the commission through our community outreach and education, our Consumer Complaint Center, which is responsible for responding to consumer complaints and inquiries, and by maintaining collaborative partnership with state, local, and tribal governments in critical areas such as emergency preparedness and the implementation of new technologies. As more and more people subscribe to internet service, many for the first time, improving the consumer shopping experience by providing consistent, reliable, and accurate information about the price is essential to ensuring that households are able to select a plan that meets their family's needs and their long-term budget. Today's hearing, uh, agenda includes a round table with broadband navigators from around the country. Um, and so they'll be able to share some of the challenges of connecting the unconnected. And we'll also hear from uh, partners um, that, are, that have been in the label space for some time, um, featuring speakers from the Food and Drug Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and we'll also feature a fireside chat with CGB's Disability Rights Division to hear about how a broadband label can be most useful to people with disabilities. Thank you in advance to our featured speakers for sharing your afternoon and expertise with us and for helping us develop a broadband label that is as effective as possible for consumers around the country. I also wanna thank all of you who are tuning in live on fcc.gov forward slash live. We invite you to join the conversation by email um, and please submit any questions you might have to broadbandlabelshearing at fcc.gov. Our team will be monitoring that inbox throughout today's presentations and to set aside, set aside some time to allow our speakers um, to speak to your submissions. So before we begin today, it really is my pleasure to introduce two of the FCC's uh, commissioners to lead off today's hearing. So please join me in welcoming uh, commissioners, Brendan Carr and Nathan Symington. Commissioner Carr, the floor is yours, welcome. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Alejandro. Uh, I can't match that really cool background you have over there. I've just got, you know, some some blinds behind me, but I'll, I'll give it a shot here. Uh, first of all, obviously, thank you to everybody that is uh, really volunteering your time on this effort. Uh, transparency is the best disinfectant. Uh, and so I'm very excited about moving forward uh, and seeing what we can do. Obviously, one, within the, the direction that Congress gave us here to move forward, but two, in ways that we can uh, continue to build on transparency uh, in the broadband marketplace. And I think as we go forward, the most important thing for me is going to be to make sure that we do this in a way that's going to be simple and straightforward for consumers to understand. I think there's a lot of, you know, really interesting information we could want um, either ourselves at the FCC, academics, uh, various people, but we have to keep in mind that, you know, these are purchasing decisions that are going to be made um, by families in communities all across the country. And so we really have to keep it simple, understandable, and focus in on, you know, what we learn through this process in terms of what does make a difference. You know, is it, um, is jitter a, a key feature that someone is going to rely on uh, when compared to other things? I'm, I'm not so sure about that. So that's an example of where I think we really have to keep it focused on, you know, the actual information that's going to be actually meaningful uh, to the consumer, to the family, making the purchasing decision. So I think simplicity is a goal. There is a whole uh, doctrine about uh, overwarning or information overload. I think we've got to be very careful that we don't end up um, in a spot like that. But I think there's, you know, wide, wide room for us to take action here uh, in a way that's going to be beneficial to consumers if we keep that, that goal in mind. Separate, I know it's a little bit off, off topic for this particular group, but it's something that I care about is you know, transparency and more disclosures um, across the whole internet ecosystem. Uh, thankfully, we do have a, a good baseline out there with ISPs today, uh, in part uh, from the transparency rules that have remained in effect um, from the FCC's decision in uh, 2017. Again, I'm open to, you know, changes or modifications, um, particularly as this group comes up with it. But if you look at where the real black, bo black box is right now, uh, it's in a different portion of the internet ecosystem, whether it's Google search results where almost virtually overnight, you could have a small business whose website traffic spikes or um, gets suppressed. And that can make all the difference in flipping their business case from, uh, you know, red to black and, and, and vice versa. So I think more transparency there would be very helpful. Same, I think on the social media side, 
Um, you know, there's a lot of concerns about content moderation and a lack of transparency around that. I think, you know, many other segments of um, sort of the broader internet ecosystem uh, could benefit from uh, some modicum of transparency. So again, I don't know if that's going to be the, the core work of this particular group uh, or the FCC's ability in this proceeding. But I do think as we think generally about the needs of consumers in the internet space to make informed choices, um, I think it's important that we be mindful that that extends to um, purchasing or using, in the case of free services, um, uh, technology services that are beyond the ISP level. Uh, but again, back to the core purpose of this particular group, uh, I'm really interested in ways that we can move forward that is going to be truly informative to consumers, help drive uh, purchasing decisions. And, and again, I think focusing on that initial purchase as well would be important. So uh, look forward to all the work that this, this good group is going to do. So thank you so much. Really appreciate that, Commissioner Carr. Thank you so much. Commissioner Symington, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much to Greg Halegian for the kind invitation to speak to you all today, to our new Bureau Chief Alejandro Roert for leading the proceedings, and to everyone in attendance for doing this important work. Today's meeting will cover three important topics. First, the importance of transparency in product disclosures at the point of sale, and a discussion of the diverse ways in which Americans buy broadband. Second, lessons learned from other regulatory efforts regarding labeling in the food and fuel economy contexts. And lastly, ensuring that broadband labels are easily accessible and legible to every American. These are important subjects that must inform the Commission's approach to broadband labeling. I'd like to drill down on a couple of them and maybe spare you my general thoughts on you know, economic theory in the context of labeling with which some of you are by now all too familiar. So it's imperative that we ensure that labels are accessible to every consumer. We can think of this in two ways which are equally important. First, we should ensure that when we require ISPs to disclose facts at the point of sale about the broadband product a consumer is purchasing, that disclosure is made in a way that is accessible to every American, including those with visual and hearing disabilities. While we are not, I believe, specifically bound to functional equivalence in the domain of labeling, there's nothing preventing us from applying the framework of functional equivalence to labeling, and indeed we should. So I'm so pleased that the Disability Rights Office will be taking this important question up today. Second, we should ensure that the labels are scrutable for every American customer. Uh, by this, I mean the disclosures here have to be centered on not just every fact about the broadband product someone is buying, but on the facts that are most pertinent and salient to the purchasing decision. That is, those that are likeliest to be helpful to a consumer's overall understanding of the product. Fuel economy stickers on car windows, for instance, relate to city miles, highway miles, gallons per hundred miles, fuel costs, and smog and greenhouse gas ratings. What they don't include are things like ignition compression ratios. Why not? Because while an ignition compression ratio is a central component of the overall fuel economy rating, it's irrelevant to what consumers actually care about or are likely to understand about their car's fuel efficiency. We don't demand that every customer become an automotive engineer in order to read them. Almost everyone in this meeting who drives a car has some sense of their car's miles per gallon, and surely that was a factor in their purchasing decisions. Maybe there's some sense of the greenhouse gases generated at the tailpipe. But what's the compression ratio? Does anyone know? I'm afraid I don't. Does anyone care? Unless you're a real gearhead, it's probably superfluous information. So we should ask what consumers care about regarding their broadband experience and focus labeling on disclosures that have the highest impact on the purchasing decision. That way we're best positioned to create not just informative labels, but effective ones that will make a real difference in consumer welfare. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. And I look forward to seeing what comes out of today's meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Symington and, and Commissioner Carr. We really appreciate you joining us today and for your leadership on the commission. So with that, I'm actually happy to turn um, over to our first session on our agenda, which features a roundtable discussion with broadband navigators and digital inclusion advocates from around the country. We are honored today to be joined by Emily Chi from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Brent Wilkes from Hispanic Federation, and Magdalena Wittenzelner from East Hartford Public Library. So uh, Brent, Emily, and Magdalena, welcome. So Emily, I'd love to kind of start with, with you. You know, the uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice has really been a leader in the digital inclusion space. You guys also lead the Asian Tech Table and have um, a suite of uh, digital inclusion programs that you offer across the country and have been really active um, in ensuring that technology in all of its forms is available to the, uh, the Asian American community. Do you mind kind of sharing a little bit more about your work um, and what you've learned about the way that uh, the community that you represent 
um, makes kind of broadband purchasing decisions and maybe where the gap exists about um, the adoption gap between those that, that have already subscribed and those that um, maybe don't, aren't subscribed yet and what you feel like the challenges there are. Absolutely. Um, thank you again so much to the FCC, to the commissioners and Alejandro for um, uplifting this really important issue and, and always doing the work to get our communities connected. We really appreciate all your work um, that goes into Close the Digital Divide. Um, so I'm Emily Chi. I'm the director of Tech, Telecom and Media at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. Like Alejandra already said, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that works on federal issues, but we also work with um, almost 250 API serving community based organizations in 37 states all over the country. Um, so we've done, like you said, quite a bit of work on digital divide issues, but especially with the pandemic, we all saw how essential um, the internet really is, you know, not just for um, getting online for fun or for work, but also for education, for healthcare, we're growing increasingly reliant on internet and the folks who need it the most are often the most marginalized populations who already lack access to these types of services. So not having internet um, is going to um, exacerbate these issues and, and bring them farther away from the services that they rely on to survive. So when we think about the digital um, digital equity for APIs, um, there are about f there are five issues. There are a lot of issues, but I'll focus on five issues today. So first is we need to better understand what the need and the challenges actually are. There are very few studies that have actually been conducted on APIs um, communities and what our access to broadband actually is in the status quo. So so a lot of these studies aggregate our communities or don't accurately um, interview folks in, in non-English languages and exclude our most marginalized populations and so make it seem like we have better access than we actually do and that's you know a version of the proliferation of the model minority myth where there's this assumption that economically we're better off we have higher levels of educational attainment and therefore we don't need services like this which is false um, if you look at other data points such as income such as um, reliance on other federal programs like food stamps you see that asian americans are in great need of those services and therefore we can assume that there's also a great need for internet um, so an issue that we saw um, during the pandemic was that we saw some students asian american and pacific islanders just disappear so for example in native hawaii and pacific islands you know we talk about rural america all the time and assume that we're talking about continental U.S., but really even, you know, in the Pacific Ocean, in these um, U.S. territories, the broadband access is a huge issue, and they're really rural areas that also deserve our attention, and we can't forget that minorities, including APIs, are included in those populations. And they'll also say that language access is critical. So a significant portion of API communities are LEP, meaning they're um, low in English proficiency. So when they're trying to access these services like ACP or just signing up for internet with a ISP, um, they are often unable to navigate the process because um, the translations aren't available in Asian languages. Also note that there are historical inequalities at play. So um, things like uh, historical redlining are becoming digital redlining. So what are the neighborhoods actually look like um, where these communities are living? Like, is there infrastructure to even support high-speed internet? Are the landlords engaging in kickback agreements with certain ISP? So only certain um, buildings have access to certain ISP plans. We need a really re evaluate this um, problem holistically and think about the historical factors are at play as well. And then lastly, I'll say that um, digital and media literacy are also key. So it's not enough just to give people internet. They have to make informed decisions um, when they're purchasing internet, but also beyond the per point of purchase, they need to make sure that they have information about how to best use the internet to actually access the services they so need, um, need to be, know how to protect themselves, how to put security measures into place so that they're not vulnerable to more harms um, once we connect them to the internet. Um, so that's key as well. Um, so we want to make sure that um, as we're signing people up, we're not seeing a drop off. We've heard reported during the COVID pandemic, um, as we've gotten our communities to sign up, that one of the biggest challenges is navigating all the different plans, the ISPs, the data packages. And as you can imagine, if someone 
this is media or digitally literate yet and they don't speak English, these systems are even more difficult to navigate. So we want to make sure that whatever labels are put in place have language access as a top priority, um, including language access for languages that might not be alphabetized and might need verbal or video type translations. We also want to make sure that whatever is pushed out to the public is going to be well tested with intended users. Um, so for example, we found that in our work with the community, the word broadband is not a common word and people often don't know what it actually means. So we should be switching it to things like the word internet instead. You know, use the vernacular that actually reaches the community. And also you're testing for technical issues too, right? Like if someone is logging in to see these um, nutrition, uh, broadband nutrition labels um, on their mobile device. Does it actually work? Do the translations show up the way they should? Um, so we want to think about it really through all stages of consumer engagement, including, you know, at the very end, if they want to cancel, is there a line they can call with a translator um, that will let them know of all the fees, um, all the risks, all the, you know, agreements that they might be in violation of when they cancel a plan. So we really want to see it at every stage for every consumer. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. We really very much appreciate that. You know, um, next I'd like to go to Brent. You know, you do uh, at Hispanic Federation, and I think um, and throughout your career, you, you've done a lot of, you've been a leader in kind of uh, digital inclusion, digital equity across the country, um, specifically focused on the Latino community. You know, I'd love to hear about your work and as you have been engaging with, with this community and um, establishing, you know, community-based, digital um, literacy programs, what have you learned? Where are the sticking points? And how might a broadband label help ensure that there is a, an easier on-ramp to internet connectivity that, um, that might ease um, some of the barriers that, that the Latino community currently experiences? Thank you, Alejandro. And, and by the way, congratulations again on uh, being nominated for this wonderful position as Bureau Chief. We're very proud of you. and. Um, so super excited to see the FCC um, really diversifying its workforce. So um, congrats to you and to the team. Um, so yeah, this, this has been a lifelong passion of mine to focus on how do we close the digital divide for the Latino population. And, you know, it is a significant divide and one that really is impacting the opportunities that Latinos have both in the academic space, but also um, in the workforce. Um, as many know that the teen population is the fastest growing population in the country, but also very fast growing are the jobs that demand technology skill sets. Um, and um, we see a challenge um, coming to the fore, which is that um, lots of Latinos haven't really taken that technology track, um, both in their under, undergrad, uh, even elementary and secondary and undergrad uh, opportunities. And then, um, and yet the workforce, uh, even, even non-technology jobs are still demanding tech skills. And so there's, there's been a, a huge challenge. And I think the pandemic really pointed out how that was such a, um, a significant uh, barrier for Latinos who had been displaced from some of the older type of uh, workplace opportunities. New opportunities opened up in the tech space and they weren't necessarily prepared to, to, to get those, those opportunities. At Hispanic Federation, you know, we, we are a traditional Latino nonprofit. We've started in 1990, so we're over 30 years old now. We focus on education, health, immigration, civic engagement, economic empowerment, and the environment. So a lot of the, um, the, the same topics that many Latino organizations focus uh, on. And we're currently in 41 states across the country, uh, helping over, over um, you, know, you know, millions of individuals with these different types of programs. But we really started focusing in on digital skilling several years back um, and the need to help our community get online to be able to get the technology skills that today's employers are demanding and to make sure that they have an opportunity to be competitive. And so we're currently operating 42 digital uh, training centers across the country. Uh, those are in 19 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico. Um, this is really focused on the types of tech skills that will help get you a, a job opportunity. So we're doing a lot of certifications. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, consulting with local employers to find out exactly what they're looking for. And then we teach those same tech skills to the folks that come in through the door. But one of the big focus challenges for us has been 
that when people do come to the door, many of them aren't connected up at home. And so the broadband adaption piece, while it wasn't necessarily our initial focus, has become a necessity uh, for these uh, centers to be able to connect people up. And then when the pandemic hit, it became a crisis, really. Uh, uh, unless we had connectivity um, at home, we weren't able to do the distance learning classes that many of the centers wanted to, to continue doing. So we scrambled, we came up with hotspots, we were doing laptop lending libraries, um, trying to get the tech into people's homes. And I think that's when we really understood how, how um, dramatic and challenging the fact that not having the community with broadband in the home um, really, really is. And um, it's been, you know, to be honest, a lot of frustrating um, and challenging because um, there are so many different ways of connecting um, people would uh, participate in a program, not not necessarily, I don't want to say government program, but a program that they, they heard about, um, have trouble enrolling in it, um, not be um, satisfied with the speed, uh, find out that there's caps on the data and um, end up, um, you know, kind of getting mad at us because, you know, we're the ones that said they should get connected and then, and then um, they end up having a bad experience. So I think what you're doing with the labels at the FTC is, SEC is really important because um, it's not every uh, offer is equal, but it's ha sometimes hard to make sense of what's out there. And I, I, I certainly understand Commissioner Carr's concern about don't put too much information on the label. I, I agree with that. I understand that. But on the other side of it is there's so many different options that the ISPs themselves have come up with that sometimes it is confusing. And especially if you're saying mobile is also a broadband provider. So now, now they got to compare two very different types of, you know, mobile and, and um, the traditional wireline ISP. Th those are two different, very different types of services. And so b having um, a label that helps people make a informed comparison to see if it really will satisfy the need that the family has to be able to do distance learning, to do telehealth, to be able to do the workplace opportunities from home, to participate in training programs like the ones that the Spanish Federation offers. I think that's absolutely needed. And you know, we are really excited that you are pursuing um, this mandate from Congress. And we're hoping that um, together we can come up with something that will really help inform people, not confuse them. We understand that's not, not what we want to do here, but there should be a way of being able to say, okay, this is this is going to work for me and I can afford it. Um, that's the other thing I, I should mention is a number of them felt a little bit stung by the bill, especially when they exceeded their cap of data. And um, you go through that really quick if you're doing distance learning or you're doing some type of video like we're doing right now. If we're doing that um, for your workplace, that can burn through data super fast. And so those data caps are an important factor for everyone to consider when they're looking at these labels and trying to decide what um, broadband service is gonna work for them and at what price point. So thank you. I appreciate that, that, that insight, Brent, and we'll definitely kind of loop back around um, after we chat with, uh, check in with Magdalena. So Magdalena, you know, similarly, I think you work for, you know, community anchor institution, you work for the East Hartford Public Library um, and would love to hear about what type of community that, that, that you serve, the kind of programs that, that you offer and you know and the library i remember going to the library when, when i when i was young to uh, connect to to the internet and you know librarians really are there as kind of technical support so you guys really are on the front lines to understand um, how comfortable people are at um, using the internet how useful it is to them and also i think to kind of uh, maybe support people through that shopping experience so would love to hear about your efforts on the ground and maybe what you've learned um, based on the community that, that you serve in Hartford. Yeah. Thanks Alejandro and thanks to everybody doing the work. Um, I think we're at a really special moment in, in time and in skill and, and in ability where we can make a big change and I'm so excited to be part of it. Um, as part of that excitement, actually, I am a digital navigator, librarian, and program manager here at East Hartford Public Library. Um, we are running an ARPA-funded program, and we have a team of five navigators here on the ground, including myself. Uh, we connect directly with families in our community. Uh, East Hartford is very diverse. We've got a population of above 51,000, uh, so we're a medium-sized town right across from the capital city of Hartford. 
but we have a lot of diversity. And, you know, in our schools, for example, we've got students from 63 countries who report speaking 55 different languages. So being able to support navigation and support folks in learning how to use technology um, across lots of languages, across lots of experience, has been a real moment of learning um, where, you know, I'm seeing a lot of the things that Emily and Brent have talked about. We're looking, um, we've got quite a few LEP adults who are out there trying to decide what kind of internet's going to work for their family without really having the ability to understand what they're looking at means. And just besides that, people who are native English speakers are often not equipped with the, <laughs> the ability to discern you know, are they comparing apples to apples? Um, so one of the big things that we do on my team is to help folks guide that experience and really assess what program they're looking at, what those fees might look like, and putting them directly next to each other is, is a big part of what we're doing. Um, so we are uh, partnered with our schools and we are working to get not only the adults in the room trained up, but the students as well. So when I think about um, a label that would work well for a family that would help people actually understand what they're buying, um, I keep coming back to the idea that the label needs to be highly visual um, and not text-based, which is, I understand, the most complicated ask in the world. But um, you know, when you're trying to decide what you're actually looking at, what you're comparing, if you're talking about that mobile data versus that wired line, um, you know, if you're talking to someone who literally is sitting in front of a computer for the very first time, and you know, out there doing the English as a second language classes, communicating with the teachers in English. It's an incredibly, incredibly intimidating task for families. Um, and so just like Brent said, you know, as the expert, as the person that says, you know what, I really do think this plan is going to work for you when it doesn't, when the cap is exceeded, when that, you know, when there's unintended expenses, um, <laughs> those can be very challenging. And those are very challenging interactions to navigate. Um, so, you know, my, my hope is that, as we look for really robust labels that do all those things that Emily was talking about, that work great on mobile devices, that work great across language, we remember that text-based labels likely are not our most universal option, um, especially when you're in a situation where the person that I'm most easily able to communicate with as a person who only speaks English um, is eight years old. So I've been doing a lot of navigation that, you know, centers on children and families. And in a lot of cases, it is those children who are the truly bilingual person in the room. So they are the greatest resource, but also need to be able to interpret what they're looking at as well. So I'm, while I'm in no way suggesting they need to be children's labels, they do need to be something that a child can recognize, understand, and interpret when their parent is asking them to do so, you know, or other adult um, is asking them to do so. So that's a, that's, and it's in keeping with our um, two generation approach where we teach the entire family a skill. So that's, um, you know, a very important part of, of what I would like to see in a label going forward. Thanks, Mandela. I really appreciate that. And I think it just further illustrates um, or brings a, another perspective into this kind of hearing process, right? It's just how do we really ensure that we are, um, that a broadband label delivers critical information um, to everyone that, that might be uh, shopping for um, at-home broadband. So, you know, I'd love to kind of follow up with, with all three of you. You know, you guys have had a chance to review the, the proposed kind of 2015-16 labels would love to kind of get your, your reactions to those. And specifically, I think, as we kind of engage with this hearing process and with our potential kind of future rulemaking, we're considering three key things, right? Content on the label. Is the information that's, that's maybe proposed in that 2015 label enough, right? Does that give consumers enough context? Um, we are also looking about uh, placement. Where should the label appear? How should it appear? Um, should we should it be linked 
Should it be downloadable? Uh, we also kind of talked about um, the importance of kind of a language access, right? Should the label be available in multiple languages and how, right? And, 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 and I think uh, following or later on in today's agenda, we're going to be talking about um, with disability advocates to see, you know, um, what does, how do we translate the information on that label to make it even more accessible uh, to people with, with disabilities? Um, so would love your thoughts and reactions to that label. This is the perfect kind of venue and forum to um, react, I think, earnestly um, and give us, you know, information that might inform the development of, of a label that would kind of meet the broader needs of the community that you serve. So happy to start with Emily, if, if, if we want to go back to you and then maybe Brett to Magdalena. Sure. Um, thank you, Alejandra, for sending up that question. Um, all three of those things are definitely important and things that we're thinking about. So I'll start with content. Um, if one of the issues that we're concerned about, um, and, and some of the commissioners and Brent also raised this, is how much information do we include and what do we include? And my answer to that is, ask the consumers um so you know when we go out and we walk like folks like magdalena who are on the ground are walking through um, folks with this process you know what are the questions that come up the most what are the issues that people are the most concerned about right so we need to figure out which metrics are the most influential in helping people ultimately make their purchasing decisions. Um, so for example, when we bring this nutrition label to some of our community members and we say, what do you think about this? They say, what does all of this mean, right? Download data, upload data, um, these different numbers, what does this all represent? And we've realized that to them at the end of the day, that's not what's important to them. What's important to them is how many people can be on Zoom in my house at the same time? How many videos can I download before I hit my limit? You know, what's the difference between upload and download? Like you have to tell them like, are you going to be on video or are you just watching video? Um, so all of those things need to be broken down into language that is the most easily decipherable um, by folks. Um, and it needs to be easily accessible on the label. So just doing a test of what are the most important things to people and what are they really looking at? You know, maybe it's cancellation period. Um, maybe it's um, the number of devices you can connect um, the internet too. So all those things should be determined by the consumer. So I think test testing is really important to come up with issues that we think are going to be important then, and then ask for feedback and make the label something that's iterative. So it's changing as we understand consumer behavior and their priorities better. Um, next on placement and appearance, I'll say um, definitely echo what Magdalena said about making it a little bit more visual because like we said, we know that a lot of folks are going to have issues with English proficiency and some folks even with translations, they're not going to be able to read what's written. Um, so making it as easily accessible as possible by either adding audio and video or adding visual tools um, will be really helpful. And we also want to make sure that there's information um, on there, actually going back to content, about ACP and other programs that folks will qualify for. So currently, a lot of the folks that we're helping navigate through this process are folks who are qualified for the ACP um, subsidy. So their most one of their most important point data points as they're making this decision is, can I use my subsidy on this plan or not? And that should be clearly visible. So really going back and understanding what are the most important factors to them. Like, so for example, we see on the past nutrition label, there's a breakdown of all the different costs, like the extra fees, the rental costs, etc. But ultimately, someone might just only be interested in the very final cost that they're going to pay monthly. Um, so doing the research up front to get that information. Um, and then I'll also add that an important thing is language, like you said, um, the third point. So making sure that not only these things are translated, but that they are available in vernacular language, right? So a lot of these labels are currently in their proposed form have a lot of technical language. When that language is translated into non-English, it's still not decipherable to folks because this is technical language that they've never had to use or have had to hear, be, hear because they're not um, folks who have been online who are made, um, very um, legible in their media and digital um, consumption. Um, so making sure that 
they they're easily decipherable that folks on the community side who are trusted messengers are helping folks decipher this as they work through it um, all those things will be incredibly important i hear that thank you emily uh brett uh similar any kind of reactions to the 2015 label and how um you think we can uh, achieve our goal of an effective label to serve consumer needs well i think it's got the basic things that you need to have, um, which in my mind are price, speed, and the amount of data that's available. So I think it got it has that covered. Um, but but where it gets confusing is that there's a lot of the variation even amongst those three criteria. Um, for example, um, and I won't name any names, but like my ISP starts off with a teaser rate. And then over the course of um, several years, the rate goes up. So what's the real price? Is it the beginning price or is it the end price? How do you capture that on a label and keep it simple? Uh, you know, basically follow the car rule. I'm not quite so sure. Um, I guess I would suggest if there's any way for you to think about like an APR type of thing, like they have in the finance industry where, you know, the, yeah, they somebody has more points and then the rate's lower, but then the other person has a, a higher rate but the lower points and trying to figure that out as a consumer is really hard. Uh, you have to have a pretty sophisticated calculator, but then there's the APR, which tells you, you know, what the what the FDIC requires, you know, the, the lender to, to come up with and, and show, okay, this can be compared across all the different, um, you know, loan offerings. And so I think, I think if you could come up with a way of, of you know, maybe you can't statutorily, but if you can, I think that'd be great to be able to say that this is what kind of the, the average cost is going to be, um, you know, throughout the lifespan of this particular offering uh, from this provider. Um, and then, and then I think that um, then I do agree that, you know, this, this, uh, the icons are going to be better or the, the, the graphical way of communicating this is going to be better both because of the, the complexity of the topic, but also I think it'll help you with your the ability to translate into different languages, which was which is absolutely essential. Agree with agree with everyone here that um, we have to have this available in multiple languages. If you're going to put it on the website, I think that's pretty easy to do, and, and you know links and things of that sort. If it's on the product, that becomes a little bit harder, um, and that's where perhaps the icons can be used or the graphical um, representation can be used on uh, in the printed versions of, of, of this label with the link to the more detailed information um, that would be translated into mul multiple languages. Um, I think that would you know, potentially be a way for you to, um, to get the, the needed information across to, to multiple people. Um, and then it, I think it's also going to be an interesting bridge for you because I see you have two separate labels, one for mobile, one for, one for fixed. Um, but at the same time, you're asking consumers to kind of try to bridge that gap and figure out what, you know, which is the better option for their family. Um, and so I think it's, it, it, it'd be helpful for you to figure out how, how, how would you as a family go about comparing what the advantages and disadvantages of mobile versus fixed are and how do you, how do you, um, um, you know, make an assessment about what's the, the most needed for your family. I think that's where those data caps are going to come in and the cost for additional data, and in some cases speed, um, those are gonna be factors as well that need to be really limited well by the label. But I think it's a great start, definitely much better than having nothing. And so I don't wanna seem as a seem, sound like a critic. I just wanna say that, um, you know, I think, I think we can continue to make it a little bit easier to understand, um, translate it, and then, um, you know, but definitely go forward because this is, this is absolutely needed. Thank you, Brent. Magdalena? Yeah, and so I just want to echo those things that have been said and, and to reflect on something that I forgot to say in my intro, which is that, um, like Emily was saying, there's a lot of consumers who are very interested in knowing whether they can use their ACP, Affordable Connectivity Program credit, to purchase a particular internet plan. Um, in here, in East Ar here in East Hartford, we are a community eligibility provision um, town so that all of our students get free breakfast and lunch and everyone who has a student in public school does qualify for ACP. So uh, my team and I have had a lot of experience in sitting next to people while they try to decipher whether the program that they are interested in 
is actually eligible. So I would even encourage right on that Lifeline website where everybody has to go to just drop directly into selecting a program um, versus having to go back into your ISP, take that verification number, mail it to them, input it. Every, every ISP has a different method that they want you to submit your approval through. Um, so it really becomes extremely overwhelming. Um, and I think that our best sort of our best um, approach is to place those labels where consumers are making the decisions, right? So not necessarily within the ISP, not necessarily, you know, in the case of that um, ACP application, right there on the Lifeline website. So you can say, here's my zip code. Here are the internet service providers. Um, you know, that information exists. And Lifeline could tap into the existing information and then drop you directly into your ISP. Um, that should also, you know, you should be able to access that, not have to download a PDF to be able to look at the label. Uh, if you have to download a PDF, you lose people, uh, which, you know, for most of us, it's a very straightforward thing. Click the PDF, it downloads, click it. Um, I've done a lot of work with folks helping them to understand how to look at a PDF that they downloaded onto their computer. Um, so it's really important to think about, you know, number of clicks before you can get to something. So when we think about placement as easily, you know, can you mouse over something and have it magnify for you? That's something that people love. You know, can you click it, tap it with your finger on a mobile device and have it enlarged to fit the full screen? These are the kind of things that make things easier for folks to access and reduce frustration. Um, I call it click fatigue. You know, if you've had to click 37 times to get one document open, by the time you do that, you are not here for another one. So it's really important to make it as simple and direct as possible. Um, and really getting that technical language out of there is, is so important. You know, we're talking about folks who don't have English as a first language. And I'm also here to tell you that for folks who have English as a first language, a lot of what my work is and the work of my team is to explain what all of those things mean. So it's, it's really, you know, a hover over is something I absolutely love so that you can just point your mouse at something without needing to click. And it says, okay, your speed, this is your download speed. That means when you click a video, how long it takes you between the click and being able to look at the video. It needs to be that kind of explicit. And also to Emily's point, how many screens can be watching video in my house? That's, <laughs> you know, I've had people say, okay, 100 Mbps, what is an Mbps? And can all three of my kids be in class? And can I have a video call, right? And, and probably is the answer, right? But I don't know what else is happening in your house. So that's, that's a really important, real life, practical, applicable Thing that really needs to be on a label as well. So I really, um, first of all, I want to say I appreciate you guys taking the time and kind of sharing those insights with us. Um, really appreciate your work on the ground, your leadership and your uh, various uh, communities and really hope to kind of continue to keep you engaged in this conversation. I think that the information that you provided today gives us a lot to think about. Um, and you know, we, we are looking forward to kind of keeping everybody engaged in the process. We are just about at time, uh, but just wanna say again, thank you for joining us. Um, and at this point, I am super happy to uh, kick the mic over to um, Zach Champ, who is Chief of Staff for CGB, to kind of lead us through the other segments of today's hearing. Thank you all again. Great, thank you Alejandro and thank you to our speakers. Um, we're moving into the, the federal label segment of the, uh, of, the, of the afternoon. I'm pleased to have two speakers with, uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, Pedro Cruz, uh, who is with the FDA, uh, who will speak to uh, the Food and Drug Administration's nutrition labels. Um, something that we're all familiar with and something that uh, we're looking at closely. And then followed by Pedro's presentation, uh, we will have Brittany McCoy, who is with the US EPA, uh, working specifically on agency, the agency's fuel economy labels. Um, so we're gonna do this in like segments. Uh, so 
Uh, Pedro, I think you're up first, and we'll bring your slides up, and we'll let that kind of settle in, and then uh, then the floor is yours. You're, uh, you're on mute. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pedro Cruz, and I'm a member of the Division of Food Labeling Standards in the Office of Nutrition and Food Labeling at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. The branch I currently work on focuses on compliance and enforcement of food labeling regulations. We also answer questions from industry and consumers on all aspects of food labeling. So for the first part, in my presentation, I will briefly talk about food labeling requirements followed by e-commerce and food labeling. As you may know, um, labeling is a crucial tool to provide consumers with information to make informed decisions and improving their diets. We want to make sure that consumers have access to easy to understand nutrition information to make healthier choices for themselves and their families. As a result, in 2018, FDA announced the Nutrition Innovation Strategy which sets strategic courses for taking action to reduce preventable death and disease related to poor nutrition. As part of the agency strategy, this campaign supports consumer education as a key element of FDA's ongoing public health efforts. Next, next slide, please. So let's now briefly dive into FDA's requirements. FDA requires mandatory labeling requirements, including nutrition information, to be provided on food labeling under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The primary purpose of labeling information is to provide consumers with the information they need to make informed decisions. And regarding nutrition information requirements, specifically, this information allows to maintain healthy diet practices. Now, I would like to point out that all label information provided on the internet regarding food product must be truthful and not misleading. The regulation requires, requires all food package form to be fully labeled with all mandatory label information on the package, regardless of how the product is being sold, for instance, versus internet or retail store. There are no provisions that allow for the mandatory label information to be right only on the internet sales side. Currently, there are no regulations that require the mandatory label information to be provided on the internet. However, internet labeling can be, mis can be misbranded if the product makes false or misleading statements or fails to reveal material facts about the consequence which may result from the use of the product. FDA also recognizes that information available through the internet, including those websites that provide truthful and not misleading information about conventional food products can serve a value and useful function. FDA addressed this issue a food product labeling on the internet in a 2007 gear manufacturer letter. In certain circumstances, information that is disseminated over the internet by or on behalf of a regulated company meets the definition of labeling in section 201M of the act and is subject to the requirements of the act. For example, if a company were to promote a regulated product on a website and allow consumers to purchase their product directly from the website, the website is likely to be labeled, considered labeling. As another example, if the label for the product contained a statement that referred the consumer to a specific website for additional information about a claim for a product, that website is likely to be also considered labeling. The websites in these cases are considered written, printed, or graphic matter that supplements or explains the products and the design for use in the distribution and sale of the product. Next slide, please. Now let's dig a little bit more into FDA, FDA's mandatory labeling requirements that must be declared on packaged foods. You have to have a statement of identity. You have to have your net quantity of contents, name and place of business, ingredient statement, nutrition labeling, unless there's an exemption, allergen labeling, and other material facts. Next slide, please. In addition to providing mandatory labeling requirements on food label packages, FDA also has regulations for language requirements. FDA states that it is required that all mandatory labeling statements appear on the label in English. This same regulation also requires that if any other mandatory label elements appear on the label in a foreign language, then 
then all other required statements must appear in the foreign language as well in English. So for example, if a product has uh, nutrition information in a foreign country language, then that triggers all um, the requirements to have all that statement of identity, ingredient statement in that foreign language. And next slide, please. So as previously mentioned, if a product contains mandatory information in a foreign language, then all required elements must be in English and the foreign language. In the case of providing the nutrition information, we know that it may be presented in a second language if it meets the requirements of the 21 CFR 101.9 D14. When nutrition labeling must be presented in a second language, the nutrition information may be presented in a separate nutrition labels for each language or in one label with the second language translating all required information following that in English. As you can see here in the example provided, please note that numerical counts that are identical in both languages need not to be repeated. And also our regulations in 21 CFR 101.9, which uh, are about nutrition labeling requirements, did not, did not provide for another country's nutrition labeling on products sold in the US. Next slide, please. Right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit into e-commerce and food labeling. We know that prior to COVID-19, the trend of online grocery shopping was born in part because of the convenience of consumers being able to purchase groceries online from the comfort of their home. However, this trend increased exponentially due to the pandemic crisis. And as a result, more Americans have turned to online grocery shopping, increasing the sales in 2020, as you can see in the bullet points that I provided. This trend could potentially change consumer behavior indefinitely, making it increasingly important for FDA to provide future guidance regarding food labeling information that should be available to consumers at the point of purchase. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to the increased use of online grocery shopping, FDA has also noticed some changes, challenges, I'm sorry, consumers face when shopping online for groceries. We are aware that most grocery retailers, manufacturers, and third-party applications provide some label information online, such as nutrition information, ingredient information, et cetera. However, the ability for consumers to locate or view this information online varies greatly between the different types of online platforms. In addition, in some cases, there may be discrepancies between the labeling of the food package versus labeling online, including the format of the nutrition information presented online, compared to the actual nutrition information that is declared on the package label. While FDA has recommended in the past that nutrition information being presented online be similar to FDA's regulations for consistency and to avoid consumer confusion, we acknowledge that most of our labeling requirements predate online sales practice. Therefore, because of the high demand of consumer online grocery shopping, FDA would like to hear in the near future from stakeholders on how the labeling information is being displayed online and also understand any challenges they might have. Next slide, please. So as previously mentioned, FDA is interested in learning how food label information is being made available and used by consumers at the point of purchase in grocery shopping online. Now, in order for FDA to provide any future guidance in this matter, FDA first needs to understand consumer experience when reviewing label information online. As such, these are some questions that FDA seeks to understand in order to provide any future guidance. For example, how is the label information presented on the website? Do consumers expect all label information presented online to be the same as the product label that is purchased or only certain ele labeling elements? Again, these are just some of the questions that we, that we need to gather for consumers to understand and, and be able to provide any future guidance. Next slide, please. And along those lines, FDA is also interested in learning more about how online grocery retailers, food manufacturers, and third-party online grocery providers are displaying food label information, such as nutrition information, ingredient information, allergy information, et cetera, in online grocery shopping platforms. And again, these are just some of the questions that FDA seeks to understand. For example, what factors are taken in consideration when deciding what and how to provide label information in online grocery shopping platforms? It can be either website, mobile, uh, or any other application. Uh, what does the manufacturer, retail, or third-party online grocery provider ensure that the label is accurate up to date? And again, these are just some of the questions that FDA seeks to 
to understand and, and need that information in order to provide any future uh, guidance. And with that brings us to the end, and I'd like to thank you for your time and to you today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Pedro. Uh, we will have a couple of questions at the end of Brittany's presentation. Brittany, hello, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me again. My name is Brittany McCoy, work in the uh, EPA's Office of Air Quality and Transportation and our Transportation and Climate Division. Today, I'm just gonna talk briefly about our fuel economy and environment label program um, and provide some context. Next slide, please. So just a quick background, uh, fuel economy estimates uh, have been provided to consumers since the 1970s, really as a tool to help uh, folks compare the fuel economy of different vehicles. Um, we have a, a statutory requirement, I think that's unique uh, compared to maybe other label designs is that we have a statutory requirement to do fuel economy labels and apply it to all light duty vehicles. So there isn't a, a lot of flexibility in some of the things we are required to include on the label. But just to give you some history, initially we relied on data from two laboratory tests focused on the city and highway fuel economy estimates. But in 1984, we revised some of those uh, estimates in terms of the calculations of that um, to accurately reflect um, driving styles and conditions at the time. Next slide, please. So by the mid 90s, um, we had our emission certification program that required the use of three additional tests to, to capture an even more broader range of real world driving conditions. And I'll talk about that in a second. Our new methods, um, you know, we brought to life the miles per gallon estimates closer to actual fuel economy by including factors such as high speeds, um, quicker accelerations, air conditioning usage, and driving in cold temperatures. Next step, slide please. So I just wanted to kind of show briefly a timeline of the evolution of our label. It's really evolved over the years. We started in the 70s, as I mentioned, with just a pure fuel, fuel economy information um, with the DAC matrix printers. Um, and, and a lot of the, the later labels from the you know, late 80s, 90s, and in the early 2000s really uh, mirror probably what we reflect today. Our last um, redesign of the label occurred in 2011, which we got the final product in 2013, as you see here. Um, next slide, please. So um, the purpose of the label really was to provide a reliable, uh, consistent data that be that can be compared across vehicles. So we wanted the test to be controlled, um, repeatable, and really from a trusted source, um, reflecting the U.S. Uh, average driving experience. Um, not really this own perfect number, but just more of a more roundabout uh, reflection of that. So many factors affect mileage. We learned that weather does, aggressive driving, tire performance, um, excel, uh, AC usage, cruise control, city versus highway driving are a few um, that I wanted to highlight. And then remember, it's not a perfect number to each individual driver each time, um, but that all went into this latest redesign. Next slide, which I'm gonna dig more into that. So as you know, we're required by Congress to put information about fuel consumption and more recently, environmental metrics on the window sticker. So people have an equitable way to compare one vehicle to another on the basis of fuel economy. Um, and so two things, we wanted to inform vehicle purchase decisions and convey information about the, to the public more effectively. Um, and then as I mentioned, the equitable, equitable comparison component. And a lot of this information is also available for download at our fueleconomy.gov website, which I'll reference in a um, second as well. Next slide, please. So EPA in conjunction with DOT, our Office of Transportation and Air Quality here, and then NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, we conducted a joint process to redesign the label from 2008 to, to the current one in 2013 for all light duty vehicles beginning with vehicle model year 2012. And these changes were in response to the Energy Independent Security Act, also known as ISA, of 2007. And it was really because of the introduction of advanced technology vehicles as plug-in hybrid, electric vehicles, um, electric vehicles, battery electric, as well as fuel cell electric. And then changes in how Americans um, purchase vehicles started to uh, occur. So we had to kind of keep up with the times in, term of, in terms of the label design and some of the requirements outlined by Congress. Next slide, please. 
So in 2012, EPA and NHTSA, we really unveiled what I would say is the most really dramatic overhaul to our vehicle fuel economy labels. Now buyers are able to get more information, um, you know, including MPG, as I mentioned, fuel consumption rate, thinking about it in terms of gallons per 100 miles. Um, we highlighted different formats of the labels based on the vehicle type. Thinking about um, the amount of money that you save or the amount of money you spend in fuel costs over a five-year period compared to the average new vehicle, uh, the annual fuel costs, as well as performance ratings, thinking about fuel economy, as well as greenhouse gas emissions and smog ratings. And then this has allowed you to also to make car-by-car -car comparisons for your emissions. Next slide, please. So one of the things we learned um, at doing this, this process is that um, we had a goal, and that goal was really to, to figure out how to help inform the redesign of the label and increase the value of and preference for more fuel efficient vehicles. And we learned that people care about fuel economy. This is something we've seen. This is from survey results uh, from 2020, but these results have remained consistent. If anything, that, that extremely important and very important has, has increased over time with more than 50% of the population. And this is, a, this is sorry, not population, this is based off the survey results of about 4,000 adults in the US. Um, believe that fuel economy is important when considering vehicle purchase or, or, or being leased. So in the process, EPA, we engage um, a, a, a consulting firm and work with them in the development and implementation of several information gathering tasks. Um, so next slide, please. In our latest redesign, um, which Congress directed us to add environmental metrics to the label. So prior to 2012, we didn't have environmental metrics included on the label. Um, and so we learned um, a couple of things. There are, two there are types of people um, like all of us here virtually um, but we may not necessarily be the right people to design the label um, as we're closely tied to it and may not be able to see it from the lens of the average person. So I wanted to highlight four main tasks of our label uh, design process. And we did multiple iterations of this, but for the literature review, we reviewed over 80 articles to really understand how consumers decide which vehicles to purchase and factors that influence those decisions. Um, and then we looked also at focus groups. We worked with over 250 people in three different phases um, in four cities across the country. And the purpose really was to understand the vehicle per, uh, purchase process. Um, we looked at uh, the role fuel economy plays in that, the use of the current fuel economy label, label, and then what motivators and barriers are there to purchasing advanced technology vehicles. We also um, look, uh, worked with e expert panels. Um, and these are folks who uh, came from either advertising or national and educational campaigns and product introductions. And they made a history, had a history of creating social change uh, and influencing product preferences over a short period of time. And then lastly, uh, but, but not least, we did internet surveys of new vehicle uh, buyers and intenders. And we wanted to kind of really just test how well folks understood the new labels being propo proposed. Um, and whether it improved consumers' knowledge about um, more efficient vehicles. Next slide, please. So in the market research, uh, there are two types of people. We, we found that, that we have folks that, uh, that say, give me the bottom line, like just show me a figure or a graphic that can tell me what I need to know, and I'm fine with that. And then there are other types that say, show me the numbers. I want every detail, every detail that you can provide. I want to see the breakdown of it so I can fully understand um, so that was more like in the focus group in a survey component. And then the expert panel, they encourage us to keep it simple, but compelling. Um, you know, that was the main point of that. One thing I want to highlight is that um, uh, when, when asked, people always want all the information on both sides of the two types of people. However, what we learned is that when we aggregate that information together, many of uh, most times they said it was too much. So it's too much altogether, but they like it um, uh, I guess spaced out. Um, so uh, that was interesting because we have to provide certain things on the label uh, to discover during this process. Uh, next slide, please. So the first option, the folks who say, uh, give me the bottom line, they, they want a graphic. And we propose two options. This is one of the options we propose where we kind of do a grading scale. Um, where it's pretty clear A, B, C, D, and then, you know, you can zone in and you have the color coordination part and you can see how much money is saved uh, of the vehicle over a period of time, how much money you have to spend um, in the vehicle over a period of time. 
And then next slide, this is the second option we propose, propose, which aligns more with the folks who said, I want the details. And it also is more traditional. It, 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 it mirrors kind of our past labels in, in, um, uh, uh, over the years. Um, and this is more numerical um, and it gives you those numbers. You see the MPG, you see the MPG equivalent um, for the alt fuel type vehicles um, shown here. Uh, next slide. So we received a lot of comments. We received about 7,500 comments um, during this period. And it was enlightening um, and entertaining at, at times. And so uh, for, for, for each pro comment, we definitely received uh, a counter con comment to go with that as well. Um, and to be honest, it was really 50-50 um, folks, you know, in terms of the positive and, and maybe more uh, negative comments received from there. Um, a lot of it, a lot of folks thought it was great. A lot of folks thought option one was great, which is that numerical color coordinated scale scaling you see there. Some folks are just like, I've rejected. This is an EPA's job to do. Um, uh, and, you know, you get even the, you know, the interesting comments of, are, are you nuts? So um, you, you, you have to incorporate all of that in part of the process because that's our role um, as directed by Congress. So next slide. And here's where we landed. It's pretty traditional label. It's not moving too far off of what we've done in the past. This is an example of a gasoline uh, uh, vehicle um, that you would see on the window sticker of pretty much any new car um, if you go on a lot today. Um, uh, some, some familiar features you'll see are like the fuel economy with the MPG, city and highway, um, even the annual fuel cost. But we also added in per uh, ICE, as I mentioned, um, the greenhouse gas rating, fuel economy rating, this is the environmental aspect of things and the smog rating, which focuses on just tailpipe and that's important to identify. Next slide, please. Here's an example of the electric vehicle and, and compressed natural gas. And again, we have this for PHAVs, our plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, um, as well as our fuel cell vehicles, compressed natural gas and so forth, diesel as well. But I just want to highlight um, these two because you can see the, the MPG equivalent because folks like to do that comparison side by side as much as close to apples to apples as possible. Um, you can see how much you save uh, uh, in, in fuel costs over a five year period between the two vehicles compared to the new average vehicle. In this case, the new average vehicle that is a gasoline vehicle that makes up most of our uh, 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 light duty fleet. Uh, and then the annual fuel cost is associated with the fuel for that particular vehicle. So it can be electricity and or uh, natural gas. And then because it's based on tailpipe and not upstream related emissions, you see the greenhouse gas and smog rating you know, on a slightly higher scale for these two options. I want to um, zone in on the QR code shown here, uh, which highlights um, uh, if you scan it, it takes you to our fueleconomy.gov website where you can get more vehicle specific information. You get all this information shown here, but even more details are shown on our site. If you go to the next slide, here's a screenshot of um, our, our fuel, fueleconomy.gov website. From, from our research and doing that process between the focus groups, um, even the expert panel and the internet surveys, we learned that um, we needed to bring more education and a awareness about how vehicles vary in the environmental impact and empowering people to make a greener choice. So we had to develop in conjunction with uh, EPA as well as DOE, we have a joint website, fueleconomy.gov, where folks can, can do vehicle comparison and also um, you know, for very specific vehicles by model, make, um, and model year. Um, so maker, model, and um, model year. Uh, so next slide. Um, this is also a more detailed EPA based website, and it just provides even more comparisons as we think about energy information, as well as environmental information. We cover information on miles per, per gallon, range, environmental ratings, safety, uh, tax incentives, driving tips, costs and trip calculations, total cost of ownership, vehicle information, as well as advanced technology information as we think about the types of green vehicles um, um, that are out there. And so a lot of our information, actually the information that EP, EPA fuels into the fueleconomy.gov website um, is derived from our green vehicle guide website, which is just epa.gov slash green vehicles. Uh, and it's one of our top government websites. We get a lot of hits on this site. Um, so we try to make sure this information is up to date on a regular basis. Uh, next slide, please. I believe that's it. Um, thank you. Thank you guys for the opportunity uh, to, to present today and, and hopefully it's helpful.
Great. Thank you, Brittany. And uh, encourage folks to still participate in our docket. Maybe someday your comments can make our slides uh, <laughs> as we do these presentations in the future. Um, I uh, and Pedro, I'd bring you back up as well. I have a couple of questions. Um, I have many questions, but um, one of them has to do with sort of like determining yardsticks. And, and Brittany, you kind of mentioned some of this um, already. Um, you know, you have, you have on the EPA fuel economy label, you have a one to 10. You have a cost for how much fuel it would be in an annual annualized rate. Like, how do you determine what's 10? How do you determine what's one? How frequently do you look at that? Um, when do you designate what the fuel costs are? You know, right now we're going through some volatility <laughs> with that. Um, and Pedro, the same to you. Like, I think that's all, a lot of label is based on a 2000 calorie input. You know, that, that seems to be what the, the foundation has been built around. Where, where do you find those elements? Uh, and do you go back to look at them with any frequency? I'll open up to whoever, whoever wants to go first. I'll go first pretty quickly. Um, we update this information every year. Annually, our information, our inputs are updated. So every model year, is there's a, a new update. So for the upcoming model year, I believe 2023 um, is coming up. So in terms of the information, in terms of fuel costs, that's updated annually and uh, the, the makeup of what's provided in fuelecommy.gov and what's released on the label. Um, we also have an automotive trends report, which is what our compliance division, we put that out every year, our annual automotive trends report. Uh, and a lot of that information is based on our compliance data in terms of, um, so we do emissions testing that's updated annually as well. Um, and information provided through that is really what fil filters into our fuel economy estimates that we provide the fueleconomy.gov website as well, um, which in turn updates that information. So every year, something this is something we update. Um, based on the changing uh, with the latest science um, and um, where we are in terms of, I guess, cost. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, Zach. So regarding the nutrition information, as far as any updates, um, I don't know if you are aware, but uh, back in 2016, FDA, um, if, starting from 2016 till now, we have an updated nutrition information. Uh, and part of those updates were um, you have the calorie size that are larger now, the serving size that are reflected are now based off uh, recommended portion sizes. Um, when you look at the nutrients, for instance, when you look at our nutrition information, now um, you're required to have vitamin D and potassium. And um, these were all information um, that was taken, right? which was between links between diet and chronic diseases, such as obesity and heart disease. So now the update makes it easier for consumers to make a better informed choice um, by looking at those um, new nutrients. Also, you'll probably notice that now you have to have total sugars. Um, so those are, and that regarding the nutrition information, that would be uh, the update. I think that it was last updated 20 years ago. So it was overdue. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess another question I have is, um, you know, you've, you've the labels are published. What what sort of actions do your agencies take to make sure what's put out there is truthful and accurate? Um, Brittany, you mentioned the compliance division. Um, what what does that what does that look like? How does that work? Yeah, we would. So a lot of it is based on just the latest testing and protocols um, to ensure, you know, the most sound science is being used. Um, and, and usually a lot of that is is agreed upon amongst those in the field so that it may include working with the manufacturers that include working with our experts here. Well, I'm in the D.C. location, but our, our testing lab EPA's facility is in Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan um, and our Invel, uh, Invel facility. And so. Um, a lot of that includes working with our engineers and experts there um, to reach a, uh, I guess, a joint decision on the best, the, sci the, the more um, scientific approach to doing the testing. Um, so although the label itself may not change in terms of visuals of the label, the, inf the data going into the label changes on an on a, on a annual basis to ensure we're using the best sound um, science behind the information being put into it. Great. Um, I guess the other question I, I might have has to do with um, 
Well, what um, and both of you have spoken to iterations of the labels. Um, what sort of and Brittany, and maybe you spoke to it most specifically, is what surprises you had in sort of the focus group areas? I think you spoke to like folks want more information and they're overwhelmed with it. Um, what was version one, the initial sort of expectation and, and sort of what, what sort of things do you learn when you bring it out to the field? Our previous panel said, speak to consumers, like hear what they want to know. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think you're going to, you know, the. <laughs> The loudest person is usually who's heard. So that's one of the things you, you've learned and I've learned in this process. Um, and, and so, and sometimes that can be the, the, on the more negative side, uh, but you're gonna get all types of comments. You're gonna get all types of feedback. And most people on both sides of the coin want a lot of information. The problem is, is when we, we gave them all the information um, many times, that's why we went through many iterations of before we reached the final design of the label, it was, it's too much, or I didn't even notice that was even on a car that could potentially be on the car. Um, and then it was kind of like, just kind of stick to the main points. Um, the other thing is with us, we have a congressional statute. So there were some things that we could not remove from the label because we were required to show on, um, on the label. So we, we tried to get, you know, b get to the bare bones of, of what we thought was useful information. Um, and then maybe some slight changes in addition to what's required for us by congressional statute. And Zach, I would like to point out on um, the FDA side regarding the nutrition information, um, the information that's being displayed on the products right now, that's not the issue. Uh, because we have some requirements that manufacturers have to uh, adhere to, right? You have to have a statement of identity, net weight. So there's some requirements that retail packages um, elements that they have to have that. Now, the challenge comes when consumers are buying products online, right? Because not all that information is sometimes available. Sometimes a consumer sometimes can't find the nutrition information or allergen information, which is very critical. So the, those, that's the issue that, that we have right now. And, and that's something that um, we're looking forward to addressing in the future um, and find how we can provide guidance to industry on what information is valuable for the consumers to have when they're making purchases online, specifically online purchasing of food. If you could turn, thank you. If, if I could turn briefly to, to languages, um, you know, I think the FDA you mentioned has a requirement that uh, if it's a foreign language, it must also include English. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what the EPA in, includes there. Um, does that does that mean like a manufacturer would get to decide what food product is in what language? Um, so there's otherwise no mandate for foreign languages. It's a sort of a market decision. Um, and then Brittany, just broadly, like what was the APA consider? Uh, when looking at non-English language labels? I'll go first. Um, so regarding the labeling uh, retail products, right? right. We, have a, we have a requirement and it, and it basically states that the products have to be in English. However, if there's any foreign language, then all, that triggers all mandatory information in that foreign language. Now, the firm has the option to, uh, to, to have dual declarations. That's, some, that's something that we mandate. We mandate that it has to be in English, right? The only exception will be in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, um, you can have labels all in Spanish. However, even in Puerto Rico, if you have, let's say a label in Spanish, but you make reference of the nutrition information in English, and that's gonna trigger all mandatory elements to be in English. But again, that's gonna fall under the manufacturer's choice of if they want to have uh, a foreign language on their product. Yeah, we're, we're kind of in the same ballpark uh, with, with languages where English is, is the required language um, on the label. Um, typically Spanish or French are also included if um, the manufacturer choose. But on our website, there are other options uh, for other language that can be found. It just may not necessarily appear on the window sticker of the actual vehicle sold in, this, in the US. Is that sort of the, the, the distinction then, like for Pedro, for the online shopping, is, is it the same, the same rule would be in effect or? So regarding online labeling, 
it's a little bit different because we don't have codified regulations right now for online labeling. And, you know, and, and this is something new to us. That's what we're trying to uh, get more feedback, right, from consumers and stakeholders. Um, if a consumer is looking at a product, uh, let's say a cereal box, and they're going to buy it online, they're going to usually, what they're going to see is the retail package, right? And whatever information is done in the retail package, that's what they're going to see. If, it, if that retail package has dual language, that's what they're going to read. Uh, but we don't have anything right now that specifies, oh, if you're selling something online, it has to be translated. But we're going, what we're saying is, if the retail package has the, the information, uh, let's say the ingredient statement, allergen information, nutrition information in English and in foreign language, that's the product that's probably going to be received by the consumer because they're seeing that specific product. Uh, but we don't have anything right now that, that obligates um, the platforms to translate um, that required information. Great. Well, thank you. I think we'll leave it there. I, I appreciate your, uh, uh, your presentations. Um, and especially the, the genesis of where you've been and where, where the labels are going. So I uh, appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, we'll be in touch. So thank you both. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce, uh, let's see, where are we? We're at the, uh, the DRO fireside chat regarding accessibility. Uh, Susie Rosen Singleton is the chief of the Disability Rights Office, Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Um, I will turn it over to Susie for the next, next segment of uh, our proceeding. Susie? Thank you so much and welcome everyone to the Commission's Accessibility Fireside Chat. Um, I would like to invite our other two panelists to come on and join me here. While they are joining, I would like to uh, describe myself. I'm a Caucasian woman with uh, shoulder length blonde hair and a gray background featuring the FCC logo seal with the eagle that says US Federal Communications Commission. Um, and my two panelists today will be talking uh, about how to apply accessibility lenses to consumer shopping for broadband internet service plans. Uh, we've, we've heard the commission is now reviewing two broadband labels for fixed and mobile services uh, as templates for broadband providers to use. And as we know, getting the right kind of broadband service is no longer a luxury, especially for the 61 million people with disabilities and their families who may be relying on uh, those services, even more so now during the pandemic for their safety, for remote uh, work, for remote education, uh, getting access to healthcare and so forth. Uh, our two panelists are going to be talking through what can be done to ensure the accessibility of broadband labels and the availability of information in those labels to accommodate the unique needs of broadband uh, users with disabilities. So with that, I would like to go to introducing our two panelists, uh, and then I will jump right into the questions. So uh, we have with us Dr. Raja Kushalnagar, he is the Director of Information Technology Program and uh, Accessible Human-Centered Computing and Artificial Intelligence and ASL Center from Gallaudet University. Uh, and secondly, we have Clark Rackfall. Clark is the Director of Ag Advocacy and Government Affairs at the American Council of the Blind. So without further ado, I'll get to the first question for my two panelists. How can we ensure that the label formats are accessible to deaf, hard of hearing, and deafblind communities, and also to people who are blind or have low vision? In other words, could you share some best practices in order to ensure that the broadband label information is accessible wherever it's being made available, whether that be in person or online, in order to take advantage of assistive technology, including things like screen readers uh, and refreshable braille displays and the availability of that information in accessible format. So I would like to start first with Clark. 
Great. Thank you so much, Susie. And thank you to the Federal Communications Commission for holding this hearing today. And as Susie stated, my name is Clark Rockfall, and I'm with the American Council of the Blind. ACB is a nationwide membership organization that strives to increase the security, independence, economic opportunity, and quality of life for people who are blind and low vision in the United States. And critical to independence, equality of opportunity, and quality of life uh, today, more so than ever, is access to broadband, having it be available, affordable, and accessible. So the ACB is proud of our work with the FCC, uh, building on a long-standing relationship of increasing accessibility to uh, information, communication, and technology. We're active on the FCC's Disability Advisory Council, as well as the Consumer Advisory Council, and provided comments to the FCC on the broadband labeling NPRM. Um, key to those comments, as Susie stated, is, is ensuring that wherever and however the broadband label information is communicated to consumers, it must be done so accessibly. So what does that mean? Well, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and the guidance from the Department of Justice in 2010 says that information uh, or covered entities, state and local governments, uh, businesses and nonprofits, Title II and Title III covered entities must ensure effective communications for people who are blind, people who are deaf, and people with uh, speech disabilities. So for example, uh, effective communication for somebody like myself uh, who is blind could be the provision of large print information, uh, conveying information audibly, having information available in electronic text, uh, or having information available uh, so that it can be read with our own assistive technology uh, over the internet. And effective communication is done so in the method uh, that allows for an individual's uh, normal communications use. It's also important for covered entities to provide auxiliary aids and services to ensure effective communications with people with disabilities. So again, in person at a point of sale, whether uh, a, a, a by a covered entity uh, providing you know, a, a broadband or wireless service provider, a broadband or wireless reseller, uh, or uh, whether it's a full-blown storefront or a kiosk, uh, Effective communications in alternative formats, again, could include large print for somebody who has low vision, uh, but large, vin wouldn't, large print would not be effective for somebody who's blind. Somebody who's blind uh, may prefer Braille, or they may prefer to have the information uh, audibly conveyed to them or in electronic format. Uh, Braille would not be useful to somebody who does not speak uh, who does not read Braille. And effective communication must ensure uh, the two-way flow of information. So not only communication of information to an individual, but also being able to allow the individual to communicate back to the covered entity to answer any questions or comments. If the information is conveyed online via a website or application, uh, this must also be conveyed effectively to a person with disability. And there are internationally recognized guidelines by the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, most frequently used today are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, level 2.1 AA. And this allows for information and in websites and applications to be designed in a way that makes it easier for people with disabilities who use assistive technology, whether that's a screen reader um, or a refreshable braille display, like Susie said, to be able to navigate the page, uh, identify the relevant information, read the relevant information, and access any additional links or information 
um, so that they can have the same level of engagement and experience as all other consumers. Thank you so much, Clark. Uh, uh, Raja, would you like to add anything? Yes, this is Raja Kushal Nagar. Thanks. I'm teaching at Gallaudet University, and we are a research and university that only focuses the only bilingual liberal arts uh, college that uses American Sign Language and English. Um, we're talking about providing effective communication and access to information for deaf signers. Often English is not their first language uh, and a ASL can provide far more effective communication for some populations, not only for displaying labeling information, but in other contexts such as uh, VRI, video remote interpreting, call centers in order to provide information directly in sign language, point to point connections with help desks, uh, and also providing context for a user's specific uh, expectation based on their experience. Thank you so much, Raja. Uh, now I'm going to pivot to our second question which has to do with the content of the labels themselves. What are the unique information needs within the disability community that need to be included on the label? In other words, what further research may be needed into the specific information needs of people with disabilities uh, and whether there are unique needs that should be expressly indicated uh, or spoken to on that label, such as data caps or bandwidth, uh, or something that we may not have considered to date. Uh, and I'd like to start with you, Raja. For deaf consumers who rely on sign language as a means of communication, sign language, again, not a written communication, a performative communication, therefore you're needing bilateral, that means two-way communication. So you need an equal connection, both upload and download speeds. Uh, and you also need the full range of motion. So very sensitive to things like data compression. Um, the current requirements uh, in terms of the expectations of having different upload and download speeds are things that don't fit with deaf people's communication needs. So it's not like a talking head in which audio is given priority over video. And it's actually the converse for deaf people's user experience. There's an expectation of both a high upload and download speed in order to maintain high quality video at all times. Uh, therefore, uh, something that at least allows for high definition, upload and download speed. So 25 down for watching may be sufficient, but that may not equate for your upload speed. So you find yourself with a, 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 a mismatch there in terms of your upload and download speed. So you want to have those things be synchronized in order to have an ideal experience. If you've got a family of users in a household, multiple individuals, then right, you may still have a, a six and six up and down. Um, and that may be sufficient, but there are some important contingencies here as to whether we're talking about wireline uh, or mobile connections, because wireline tends to be for home use, wireless tends to be for an individual user, not a shared resource. So, so mobile is, is now being marketed for these home users, but we need to consider the needs of individuals, or are we talking about a group of individuals using a shared resource? Uh, and the next important thing for us to consider is latency of any given connection. Uh, when you're talking about audio and video transmission, it's important to have synchronicity between audio and video, for pe especially for people who are hard of hearing, maybe relying on speech reading and work at access to information. Anything more than a couple milliseconds of a delay can really make it difficult to track a conversation when you're relying on visual cues in addition to auditory cues. So the very minimum latency for these users who are deaf and who are relying on visual support in addition to auditory information. 
Uh, so I think those are two really key considerations for determining whether you're getting sufficient bandwidth and a latency that is going to be sufficient to fulfill uh, effective communication and telecommunication needs for people who are using sign language or hard of hearing people who are relying on auditory and visual support for their comprehension. Thank you so much, Raja. Uh, Clark, would you like to add anything? Yes, thank you, Susie. And just to build off of what Raja said, again, looking at the Department of Justice guidance on effective communication for uh, video relay interpreting, it says high bandwidth video that does not produce lag, uh, grainy, or choppy images. Uh, so just wanted to, to point that out as well. For people who are blind and low vision, uh, it's important to keep in mind the types of assistive technology uh, so much of assistive technology is broadband based today, especially in the mobile environment. So if somebody is navigating, um, you know, the, the older physical built environment as opposed to the virtual environment, uh, they might be using turn-by-turn uh, -turn directions from a mapping provider. Uh, there are also services like Be My Eyes and IRA that offer uh, basically remote video interpreting. So you can call up an agent, uh, somebody who's trained or somebody who's a volunteer and have them view your physical environment uh, through the camera and share with you what they are identifying and seeing. So uh, folks who are blind and low vision uh, use services that have many of the same uh, characteristics and needs as people who are deaf and hard of hearing, uh, just albeit we use them differently in different environments and for different defined purposes. Uh, and it's also quite possible that we're using several of these services at the same time. Uh, so for example, if I'm here on my desktop using a video conferencing service, uh, but I have some tech issues or need tech support, I would likely have somebody uh, run a remote diagnostic or assist me remotely uh, through my broadband connection. So all of these factors uh, layered on top of one another uh, could increase the specific broadband needs for people who are blind and people who are low vision. Thank you both so much for adding a lot for us to consider about how we can ensure that broadband labeling can be accessible and what type of content should be included into the label in order to be able to accommodate the unique needs of people with disabilities. So uh, I think that's all the time we have for today, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to continue this conversation moving forward and please do submit comments in the docket uh, for those of you who have not yet and you can contact us at www.fcc.gov accessibility uh, to get more information about our work so thank you again so much for your time and uh, now i'm going to pass it back over to zach for closing remarks just thank uh you. thank you susie and thank you to the panelists uh, I'll be brief. Thank you again for everyone for participating and lending your expertise to this conversation. Um, but also thank you to the CGB team for helping to coordinate this and make it possible. Just a few names. Deandra Wilson, Renee Coles, Diana Coho, Gerard Williams, and our Section 504 team of ASL interpreters. Uh, Mike Snyder, Greg Legian, Ed Bartholomew. Uh, Ross Slutsky, Daryl Cooper, Susie Rosen Singleton, Diane Burstein, uh, Christy Thornton, Aaron Garza, and Mark Stone. Um, again, thank you for all of the, those of you that participated. Um, there's a recording of this that'll be posted on the FCC's website uh, in a matter of hours or days. Um, so stay part of the conversation and we look forward to uh, connecting with you soon. Thank you. <laughs>